Hey, what's going on YouTube? Welcome back to my channel. This is Nathan Daly. Listen, um, we want to talk about this Kyle Rittenhouse case. A lot of people are having questions about the law and what he's actually being charged with. In my previous video, I just really spoke on the self-defense concept and really just touch on what we actually would look at when investigating a crime like this. So what are we actually looking at when we're investigating a crime like this when self-defense? We're looking at whether or not a person provoked the situation, whether or not they were in a commission of a crime against another person. And for the most part, I didn't really dive deep into the actual crime. All right, so here's a list of all the charges. Um, this is for Kyle Rittenhouse. Count one, first degree reckless homicide, use of a dangerous weapon, as we know that dangerous weapon is the rifle. And here I just highlighted the sections so we can kind of go through them pretty quickly. So in here you see um, on this highlighted section for count one, did recklessly cause the death of Joseph Rosenbaum under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life. Now this, this code section is interesting because it's reckless homicide. I think this is a more appropriate charge um, in my opinion. Uh, because it speaks to basically reckless behavior that caused the death of another person. Um, this is different than a flat out murder charge, right? But what it's saying is recklessly caused a death, um, meaning that the person's actions uh, were irresponsible, right? And uh, due to that irresponsibility, a person died because of it. But the one thing I will point out to you guys that you have to be mindful of when it comes to law, when it comes to legal cases, and then granted, I'm not an attorney, but just from prosecuting cases, being a witness to my own cases, and then spending countless hours inside courtrooms and trials and things of that nature, I'm telling you from firsthand experience, words matter. It's so imperative, even when I'm prosecuting someone or um, I'm getting warrants in order to put charges on an individual, all the words matter. I can't stress it enough how important these words are in these code sections that describe the law, these elements of the crime. You have to be very careful with these charges because you have some attorneys, some criminal law attorneys, they are word wizards, okay? And they will pick apart the law just based off of the words. And one of the things that really stood out to me after reading this law, and I'm not an expert in Wisconsin laws. You guys know I'm Georgia, so I'm more familiar with Georgia law. But I do understand the concept, and I do understand how these things are applied. And when we look, one of the things that stood out to me as I was reading this law is utter disregard for human life. When someone says utter disregard for human life, that's a very powerful statement. And an attorney is going to look at that, right? As a defense attorney defending Kyle Rittenhouse, he's going to look at that. And the whole idea is to challenge, right, the state and say, listen, how, how is this an utter disregard for human life? What does that mean? What does that mean? If you are talented at wordplay, you can pick apart these words and challenge the state on their um, on their position, right? Utter disregard. You have to show me that my client had an utter disregard for human life. How can you show me that when my client is running away? You know, how can you show me that when my client is being chased by a group, a large group of people or a mob of people? How can you show me that when, when my client was attacked hit over the head with a skateboard and someone tried to take the weapon from my client. How can you prove that this that that my client had an utter disregard for life? How can you prove that when my client only administered lethal force to those who provided who showed force to him? So this is why a lot of times when we're watching these cases, these trials and the media is presenting this stuff to us. And then you get this, you know, the trial goes on, it's crazy. And then you get this verdict, it's like, oh, not guilty. And people panic like, oh my God, I can't believe there's no reason why this person should be free or, you know, this person should have been convicted. And it's not that, again, you know, a lot of times we get caught up making this moral argument versus the legal argument. Morally, things that happen in this country, even around the world are, are not fair. It's not fair, right? A lot of times we say it's not fair. And this is true, but based on the laws that govern us, um, you know, and that's what we have to look at. 
again, it's it's always going to be facts over feelings. And a lot of times these trials don't go the way we feel like it should go. Right. Based on our moral compass, you know, and uh, but it's because we don't know the the actual elements to that particular law. And then we don't know how it was argued. And then we don't know what what evidence was presented in order to um, fight the particular charge. So um, so let's go down to. So what count two says is Kyle Rittenhouse did recklessly endanger the safety of Richard McGinnis under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life. So, again, it's the same concept of the charge. This one is just reckless endangerment, meaning that that Kyle Rittenhouse put this person in danger for their uh, their safety, for their life or um, at risk of severe bodily harm or potential death. But that endangerment did not lead to death or he would have been charged with a homicide for this particular count. All right. So let's go to count three is first degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon. So count three is a totally different charge than count one. As we see, it's reckless homicide. And this one is intentional homicide. So I want to point out this. It's two unique distinctions with count three versus count one. Count one is reckless homicide. And then count three is intentional homicide. Again, you guys, words matter. Words matter. Words are very crucial in law. So as as again, we're talking about reckless behavior, right? And this we're talking intentional behavior. My intent was to kill this person. And then with reckless, my intent wasn't to kill them, but because of my actions, the person died, right? Um, so let's read count three. So in this one is in reference to Anthony Huber, victim slash suspect. They're saying that um, this was intentional homicide. So what it states is um, Kyle Rittenhouse did cause the death of Anthony Huber with intent to kill that person. Now, um, this is very interesting because one of the biggest problems here is that you have to prove, the state has to prove that um, Kyle intended to actually kill him. Intent can be very, very complicated because essentially what you're doing is you have to be able to convince the jury, right, that in this person's mind, they had the desire the the they came for that purpose right it was in their mind right it was premeditated in nature you know you have to be able to actually put all that together and move. they're not going to get this i'm going to be completely honest with you they're not going to get this there's there you you're not going to be able to prove that he that his intentions were to kill right and why why is that very difficult to prove uh because he was being attacked he was being attacked Right. Where's the motive? Right. Like there's things that the the prosecutor has to sell. They got to sell this this package. Right. This is all it is. It's a package they put together and they have to sell and convince it. How can you how can you convince a group of people that while he was being attacked, that his intentions were to take that person's life? Right. You have to be able to get into a person's head and display that person's thoughts to a jury and that jury needs to be convinced that the intent, the motives, the desire of this person was to kill this person. This is intent is is hard to prove sometimes um, when things aren't clear cut. Right. So my thing is, you know, sometimes when things aren't laid out, it's simple. I won't say it's simple, but if things aren't laid out to really paint the picture properly, it's very hard. It's very hard to get intent, which is why a lot of times um, you'll see a manslaughter charge or a reckless charge uh, because it's easier to prove. And a lot of times the evidence supports it a lot more than intent. So I think that's a very difficult charge. I think um, what I find an issue with charging these, I, I sometimes call these political charges, right? Um, sometimes these charges are made to make the, the, the citizenry, you know, satisfied. 
But then it ends up becoming a disappointment because when it goes to trial and they're found not guilty on certain charges, people get upset. So it's a temporary fix, a temporary band-aid. And I, and I don't like that. I don't like the games that they play. Be honest, be transparent with people about the evidence and explain to them why this was not a good charge, right? People want Kyle to be charged with murder, right? That's what they want. Um, it makes them feel better to think that they're getting justice. But according to the law, it's not a strong charge to charge them with, to be honest. The reckless charge is more appropriate. So let's go down here to count four. It is uh, attempt first degree intentional homicide. Basically, this is an attempt charge, meaning that he attempted to kill another person, intentionally use homicide, uh, intentionally cause death to a person with a dangerous weapon. And it says on here, Kyle attempted to cause the death of Gage Grosskretz with intent to kill that person. Again, intent to kill them. Can you prove it, right? Uh, another intent uh, charge. This is the victim slash suspect who had the gun and was actually shot in the bicep. Who shot in the bicep during the incident. Um, he approached Kyle with the gun out right after Kyle had shot Anthony who had the skateboard. Um, so that is, that's Gage. So let's go down to count five. Count five reads, first degree, reckless, endangering safety. Kyle did recklessly endanger the safety of an unknown male under circumstances which show utter disregard of human life. I think this is going to be the black victim slash suspect this is the gentleman who ran after kyle and he did a uh like a like a drop kick and kicked kyle while he was on the ground uh, if you if you watch the video again you will see kyle actually fired at him uh, he did pull the trigger at that suspect slash victim and but he was not shot and so i believe that they're i believe and I'm, I'm not sure but when they said in here on this warrant uh, on this charge, it says unknown male. Uh, I'm assuming that that's who they're referring to. Here's another thing, too. If this male is unknown, this charge will, won't, won't exist, right? Like if they have not reached out and got contact with this this uh, suspect, I mean, victim, um, this charge, you can't have a charge without a victim. So maybe this is old and they were able to update it. But if they never made contact, they never made contact when this charge is in a drop off. You um, no no, you can't have a crime without a victim. Um, because the victim has to prosecute. So count six is a very interesting charge. This is the one that most of the people are talking about. The fact that Kyle had a weapon to begin with and he should not have. But let's look at the the actual charge because I've I've seen some comments and people have messaged me directly and asked me about it. Um, and there some people are saying that he didn't break the law. Well, um. I disagree according to allegedly I would say but according to uh, Wisconsin law count number six says possession of a dangerous weapon by a person under the age of 18 the above named defendant on or about Tuesday August 25th 2020 in the city of Kenosha County Wisconsin being person under 18 years of age did go armed with a dangerous weapon. Now, I think some people are mentioning that it's illegal for a handgun, but not a rifle, or, you know, uh, he had a hunter's license and thing. I don't know if he had a hunter's license, if that applies. But what I do see is that, and I looked up the actual law um, on Wisconsin's um, state site, and it's very plain and simple, dangerous weapon, right? A dangerous weapon, including a firearm. It specifically says firearm, right? And so also and covered in that is brass knuckles. Same thing in Georgia. We have a law for dangerous weapons and under the definition, it's brass knuckles are under there. So if he had brass knuckles, he would have been charged with this as well. So it is a misdemeanor. It's a class A misdemeanor. The reality is this. Under the age of 18, you cannot possess a dangerous weapon. So this is a very unique charge. Um, 
because it's a very catch-all charge, right? Whether he had a, a handgun or he had a, a rifle, it doesn't matter. It's con constituted as a dangerous weapon. So this charge is strong, it's solid, and it's gonna stick. I think it's very interesting. I think proving intent is gonna be difficult. I think proving the reckless is going to be easy, right? Whether or not Kyle's defense team, uh, his attorneys are gonna be able to argue a good self-defense claim. Again, and someone pointed out that, um, you know, of course he's presumed innocent and it is the state's responsibility to prove guilt. This is true. If you guys haven't sat in a courtroom and actually watch a trial and how it actually unfolds, I'm telling you, this is an adversarial system. It's competitive. You have the defense and the prosecutor going toe to toe. You wouldn't think that it was only on one person to prove uh, guilt. Okay. You have two people in there fighting. All right. You have both sides are fighting each other. So a lot of times I think it's interesting people say, well, it's I'm innocent and it's it's not my job to prove my innocence. OK, you go in there with that attitude if you want to. All right. You go in there with that attitude if you want to and you will be losing your, your case. <laughs> I promise you. Uh, so, yeah, because if that's the case, then you wouldn't you if, if you didn't have to do anything and it was just the burden of proof. Again, the burden of proof is on. The, uh, the the state to prove that you are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That's very true. But uh, you're not in there sitting down with your with your your legs crossed, you know, sipping tea. Okay, it is a high intense battle of the minds inside of a courtroom. All right, and I'm telling you, you may think that you can just sit back and relax and just like, all right, well, I'm not guilty, so prove it. No, 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 no. No, you're you're there. You're focused, and you are you are actively competing inside that courtroom for your freedom. Don't let anyone tell you anything other than that. I promise you, it is not what you think it is. It's not. It's it's innocent to prove guilt. Yeah, they have to prove it, but you also are defending yourself, um, and you are making an active effort to do so. So listen, um, I don't want this video to be too long. Uh, let me know you guys' thoughts on, on these charges and what you think. I mean, you guys, I got a chance to display uh, some of the still images. I didn't want to play the video because of YouTube, um, but you had an opportunity to kind of see the still images of what happened. And those are kind of like the raw facts. You know, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some additional evidence that we might not be uh, aware of at this moment. But I really appreciate you guys having an open mind and having um, healthy discussions in the comment section. And I'm open to hearing what everyone has to say. I, I think everyone is making valid points and we're making these points and observations based on what we know and what, what, what we've been told, right? And that's honestly at the end of the day, the best we can do, right? Give our speculation based on the information that we can find and research on our own and then also what was told to us. Again, you guys, this was a tragic situation and, you know, a lot of people are making argument about the militia group and this group and that group. And unfortunately, you guys, it's there's a lot. There are a lot of different groups out there and there's always going to be a sprinkle of bad people with bad intentions within these different groups and crowds. And so it's very hard to put a blanket label across on everybody because where there were protesters, there are also rioters and looters. OK, where there are militia groups, there are also people there who are anti-government. Right. So. And then there are groups who were there truly to volunteer and help out and keep this, keep the peace. Uh, and so unfortunately, a lot of the bad gets mixed in with the good and it comes off as, uh, and it gives those people a bad look. All right. So, um, again, thank you guys for keeping an open mind. I really appreciate the, the discussion. Um, and it's okay if we don't always agree on everything, but I think it's really good that we can come together and just have a discussion. And this is a place where I want people to feel comfortable to share and voice their opinions. And then I just ask that we all just be respectful um, to one another. All right. So again, thank you guys for checking out the video. Um, like, comment, subscribe and share. And until then, have a good night. God bless.